Jesus has reached Jerusalem. Matthew, Mark and Luke, even though they share a lot of material, have nonetheless organised it in their own way. We have seen this particularly with the Sermon on the Mount, which in Matthew is organised into a single sermon over three chapters, whereas in Luke the parallel material is spread over numerous chapters and integrated into different contexts. But in Jerusalem, the evangelists are in much tighter agreement, even though they still take opportunities to tell the gospel story in their own way. For example, Luke will stress Jesus' innocence more than Mark or Matthew. It will be repeatedly affirmed that Jesus had done nothing wrong and he will be called innocent. The scene in chapter 20 contributes to this theme and serves to highlight the wrongness of the upcoming trial. Now that Jesus is finally on their turf, there is ample opportunity for the priests, scribes and Pharisees to grill him and demonstrate in the temple in front of everyone that he is guilty of something. But despite their repeated attempts, they cannot do it. Jesus sends each party away humiliated, and the crowd is awed and delighted. Jesus also builds upon the critique he acted out in the previous chapter when he cleansed the temple, as he criticises the leaders of the Jews both in a parable and directly. Jesus' uh, teaching and statements also contain powerful Christological implications. The chief priests, scribes and elders tackle him on the source of his authority, but Jesus dodges their question and puts them on the spot. They must confess their ignorance. They are all taking part in an honour game called by anthropologists Challenge and Riposte. As John Pilch writes in A Cultural Handbook to the Bible, there is no neutral question in the Middle East because it is always possible that the one to whom the question is posed will not know the answer. The game is only ended when one party is shamed. Here the questioners are shamed by their confession, but Jesus takes it a step further. They asked him about his authority and he declined to answer directly. But now he goes on to tell them a parable which not only answers their question, but thoroughly condemns them in the process. The beloved son of verse 13 obviously refers to himself and picks up what God said about him in chapter 3 at his baptism. If God is the owner of the vineyard, which the background text of Isaiah 5 confirms, then Jesus is his son, the heir. God has sent his son as the vineyard owner sent his son. How much do Jesus' opponents understand this? They certainly understand the condemnation aimed at them, which creates a murderous reaction only checked by fear of the crowd. But surely what Jesus implies about himself did not go unnoticed, even if some of Jesus' references escaped them. They may have wanted to kill Jesus, but did they think Jesus knew he was going to die and be cast outside, that is, executed outside of Jerusalem? And when he quotes Psalm 118 to drive the point home, could they have understood the prophetic reference to his resurrection and vindication? I would have thought not, but they do recognise that they are figured as the builders, as well as the wicked tenants. They dare not risk another humiliating encounter, so they send spies to question him about loyalty to the empire. It is an unworthy trick, and it proves they could not catch him legitimately, that is, in his understanding of the law. It fails anyway, as Jesus issues another brilliant reply. Luke records that they fall into silence. Next is the turn of the Sadducees, who base their question on Leverite marriage. They do not believe in the resurrection and seemingly want to show that it is incompatible with Torah or at least enmesh Jesus in an attempt to reconcile this future expectation of some with the revealed law. Jesus' reply is in two parts. Luke, Luke drops the rebuke, which Mark and Matthew record in their parallel passages, 
which is strongest in Mark's version, where he states that they are in error because they do not know the scriptures nor the power of God, and in Mark also that they are badly mistaken. In the resurrection, people will be like the angels. In Matthew and Mark's version, found in Matthew 22 and Mark 12 respectively, the wording is somewhat ambiguous, but Luke makes it clearer. They are like the angels, not in the sense that angels do not marry, but that they do not die, even though they also do not marry. But what does Jesus mean? Does he mean that because they do not die, they do not need to marry, because you only need to marry to produce sons who will inherit your property because you yourself will eventually die? Or does he mean that in the resurrection, relationships will be of such quality of intimacy that they surpass marriage itself, hence there being no need for it? My guess is the first option, but I'm not sure. The second part of Jesus's answer proves from the Torah that the resurrection is indeed biblical. He takes the revelation of God in the burning bush for his text and shows it has a deeper meaning beyond the perfectly obvious one. The meaning is that God is the God of Abraham and not was the God of Abraham. Luke again clarifies what Matthew and Mark have written by adding, for to him all of them are alive. It is a stunning reply. The Sadducees are now also stumped, and henceforth no one dares challenge him. Now, in the silence of the temple court, Jesus asks them all his own question. He poses them a riddle based on Psalm 110. If the Messiah is the son of David, how can David call him Lord? We are left to guess what his audience made of this question, but they could not answer it. At the very least, Jesus is challenging any restricted ideas about who the Messiah was if they were still hoping for a military leader like David. But, like many of Jesus' cryptic sayings, they would only become clear in the light of the cross and resurrection.